I'd like us to bow for a word of prayer as uh, even uh, we start this session. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the blessings of the Sabbath. And Lord, as we share in thy word, I just pray you be with us, uh, thy Holy Spirit may guide us. And uh, you may guide us into the path of righteousness for the reins that, Lord, we may be able to educate ourselves in thy heavenly things. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, teach us to pray. It is something that people maybe can say that uh, this is not uh, a subject to be talked about. But uh, the disciples saw the need of being taught how to pray by Jesus Christ. And they, they, they saw the need of uh, knowing how to pray and they asked Jesus Christ to teach them how to pray. And uh, I'll just be basically looking at the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer was twice given by our Savior, first in the, uh, to the multitude in the Sermon on the Mount, which starts in the book of Matthew chapter five. And again, some months later, to disciples alone in, uh, in the book of Luke chapter 11. Uh, in this scenario of the book of Luke, the disciples had been away for some time. And uh, when they came back, they found Jesus Christ absorbed in communion with God. And uh, seeming unconscious of their presence, he continued praying. And uh, as uh, the disciples looked at the face of Jesus Christ, actually, they saw that uh, it was uh, beaming and it was glowing and he seemed in the presence of unseen. There was a living power in his words and uh, as he spoke to God and uh, they just stood there and listened to him pray. And uh, after he had uh, finished praying, uh, they told him, uh, teach us how to pray. And uh, in this instant, Jesus did not give them a new form of prayer. He basically repeated the same thing, not to teach the disciples that they must repeat the same things and same things, but uh, he wanted to give uh, a more detailed view of uh, what uh, he was teaching them at that time. And so I'd like just to go through a few basics of the things we know. And uh, I believe the Lord will bless us as we go through this session. Uh, I'll be much quoting from the prophet and uh, I believe this is the safest thing to do. I know we have read the Lord's Prayer in the book of Matthew chapter uh, 6 and then in the book of Luke chapter 11. And so uh, I'll just be capturing some uh, highlights uh, in what uh, is written uh, in inspiration. In Steps to Christ, page uh, 93, uh, when Jesus was upon the earth, he taught his disciples how to pray. He directed them to present their daily needs before God and to cast all their cares upon him. And the assurance he gave them that their petitions should be heard is assurance also to us that if we ask anything, he will be able to give us. And so he taught his disciples to pray. After this manner, therefore you pray. When you look uh, in the book of uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, is the Lord's Prayer, as I have told you, it was one, given twice by the Savior, first to the multitude in the Sermon on the Mount, and again some months later to his disciples alone. And uh, the disciples had come to connect his hour of prayer with the power of his words and works. They knew that um, no man could do the things that Christ did if he was not connected with the Father or with God. And uh, so... They cherish this moment that they had Christ praying. Now, as they listened to his supplication, their hearts were awed and humbled. As he ceased praying, it was with a conviction of their own deep need that they exclaimed, Lord, teach us how to pray. Remember, this was some months in the ministry and they had been with Jesus Christ. And uh, maybe the disciple could have been wondering, where does Christ find strength to do all he do and endure what he endures during the day? But now when they found him praying, they knew that in the mornings and in the evenings and throughout the night, he had communion with one who had power over uh, 
everything over uh, everything. And so he tells them in Luke chapter 11, verse 2, when you pray, say our father. And uh, this is much important. Why should we say our father? Jesus teaches us to call his father our father. He is not ashamed to call us brethren in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 11. So ready, so eager is the Savior's heart to welcome us as a members of the family of God that in every first words we are to use in approaching God, he places the assurance of divine relationship, our Father. And uh, people who have become parents, they understand when actually, uh, they, they understand what is parenthood and what is uh, needed of them as parents when their children approach them. And the children wouldn't be afraid to face their parents because they know that uh, these are the people who care about them. These are the people who have brought them on this earth. And so as we have a living connection with our father, which is in heaven, we understand that he's a father who is not far away from us, but he is with us to supply all the needs and the ones that uh, we as his children would like to have. And so we don't have to be worried about anything because our father, according to Psalms 24, he owns everything. In the thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 104, we are encouraged this. Here is the announcement of that wonderful truth so full of encouragement and comfort that God loves us as he loves his son. Remember, we were looking at um, TM 518.2 that uh, uh, the infinite one will not be satisfied to give us anything less than he gives to his son. And so this is what Jesus said in his last prayer for his disciples, thou hast loved them as thou hast loved me in John 17, 23. The very first step in approaching God is to know and believe that he love, that the love that he has to us, for it is through the drawing of his love that we are led to come to him. The perception of God's love was the renunciation of selfishness. In calling God our father, we recognize all his, his children as our brethren. We are all a part of the great web of humanity, all members of one family. In our petitions, we are to include our neighbors as well as ourselves. No one prays a right who seeks a blessing for himself alone. And so as we approach our heavenly father as our father, we understand that he is the father of all humanity. And in our prayers, it uproots selfishness in that now, we care about the needs of others more than even we care about our own needs. So, but if you call God your father, you acknowledge yourself, his children, to be guided by his wisdom and to be obedient in all things, knowing that his love is changeless. You will accept his plan for your life. As children of God, you will hold his honor, his character, his family, his work as the objects of your highest interest. It will be your joy to recognize and honor your relation to your father and to every member of his family. You will rejoice to do any act, however humble, that will turn to his glory or to the well-being of your kindred. And so you consider other Christians as your own brethren. And uh, this is where selfishness is uprooted in our hearts. And then we have the same character as uh, our God, as our father. He tells them, our Father which art in heaven, and this has to do with the, uh, some people are uh, confused to where actually God is in. But uh, we are told that God is in heaven. And so all this uh, simplistic view that God pervades all nature, again, they don't match up with the Lord's prayer. God is physically located in heaven and he is here omnipresent by his spirit. And so, Jesus was so careful when he was teaching how to pray, even to identify the very doctrine of where God is, uh, so that people may not be misled by pantheistic views of where God is. He to whom Christ bids us look to our Father is in the heavens. He hath done whatever he hath pleased in his care. He may safely rest saying, what time I am afraid I'll trust in thee. And so when we acknowledge God to be in heaven, we uh, actually know that he watches over his creation, that it's not a pantheistic view that God is everywhere, but he is everywhere by his uh, uh, Holy Spirit. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, we are told that hallowed be thy name. What does it mean to hallow the name of Jesus Christ? When we pray, 
hallowed be thy name, what do we actually mean in our prayers? And this is what we are told in that beautiful uh, book on thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. To hallow the name of the Lord requires that the words in which we speak of the supreme being be uttered with reverence. Holy and reverent is his name. We are never in man in any manner to treat lightly the titles or appellations of the deity. In prayer, we enter the audience chamber of the Most High and we should come before him with holy awe. There is a tendency of just uh, uh, calling the name of the Lord as we would like in jest, in jokes, in our stories, in paraphrases. And this is not reverending the name of the Lord. He says that if we hallow the name of the Lord, we should be able to revere his uh, appellations, not just to mention his name in jest in, or in a way that will dishonor him. The name of the Lord is holy. The name of the Lord is reverend. Let us not in our prayer be like uh, uh, heathens or pagans who do repetitions and babble about his name. We should hallow the name of the Lord's. Uh, we may like the Jesus in Christ, they manifest the greatest outward reverence for God and yet profane his name continually. How? By naming him unnecessarily. And so this is uh, uh, what we continue to be told in that uh, beautiful book of Mount of Blessing, page uh, 106. Concerning the hallowing of the name of the Lord, we are told, the name of the Lord is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. So the name itself reveals the character of the one whom we call our father. And if we will call the name of the father, then we have to have also his character. In hallowing his name, we accept his character in our lives. That is why the 144 are sealed with the father's name in their forehead in Revelation chapter 14. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, Exodus 34, 5 to 7. Of the church of Christ, it is written, this is the name wherewith he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. This is the name of the Lord, Jeremiah 33, 16. This name is put upon every follower of Christ. Remember Revelation 14. It is the heritage of the child of God. The family are called after the father. The prophet Jeremiah in the time of Israel saw distress and tribulation prayed, we are called by thy name, leave us not. And so just by saying, hallowed be thy name, we recognize many things that comes with that name. It comes with the reverence of the name itself. It comes with the character itself. And uh, we acknowledge that God is supreme over everything. God sends you into the world as his representative. In every act of life, you are to make manifest the name of God. How do we manifest? the name of the Lord is to, uh, to witness with our characters that really the God we are serving, he, we have uh, become his offspring, off offsprings and his character is our character. You cannot hallow we are told you cannot hallow his name, you cannot represent him to the world unless in life and character you represent the very life and the character of God. So praying, hallowed be thy name, when uh, the character is changed, then it means that you are not actually representing him in this world. And so it uh, behooves us to check on our characters. As we say, hallowed be thy name, does his character really being reflected in our life? Thy kingdom come, Matthew 6, 10. And uh, these are basics we are going through. You know, Christianity has become so complex until people have forgotten the basics. And so it is just a reminder going through these basics. The king, the kingdom come. What does it mean by the kingdom come? God is our father who loves us and care for us as his children. He is also the great king of the universe. The interest of his kingdom are our interest and our, we are to work for it is a, a holding. So when uh, we pray the kingdom come, and before it is revealed literally in the skies of heaven and the saints are given the kingdom to reign over the wicked, it must be manifested before the second coming of Jesus Christ that as we are praying, when we are going through the Lord's prayer, we are reminded of the things that are coming. 
And so we have to establish his kingdom in our hearts if we will be partakers of his kingdom when it is established. The kingdom of grace has now to be established in our hearts. It is full establishment, it's the kingdom of glory, and we cannot be partakers of the kingdom of glory during his second coming if we have not become the partakers of his kingdom in our hearts. But before the second coming of Jesus Christ, this gospel has to be preached. Everyone has to accept Jesus Christ as the king of the kingdom that is coming. If we wouldn't accept him as the king in our hearts and let him reign over us, then there is no way we shall be partakers uh, of his kingdom of glory where he will be the king. If we revolt against his kingdom in our heart right now, we can be sure that we will revolt against his kingdom when actually he comes in the clouds of the air. And uh, uh, when we pray that the kingdom come, we are praying for his sanctification, for darkness to be dispelled from our hearts so that righteousness, which is the very foundation of the kingdom of God, may reign in our hearts so that when we partake of that literal kingdom, that his righteousness continues to be our rear guard and our watchword and everything to us. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, he says, Thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. What does it mean, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Basically, what I'm going through is the book, The Mount of Blessing, and I'll be sharing these highlights with you. The will of God is expressed in the precept of his holy law, and the scripts and the principles of his law are the principles of heaven. The petition, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, is a prayer that the reign of evil on earth may be ended, that sin may be forever destroyed and the kingdom of righteousness be established. Then in earth as in heaven will be fulfilled all the good pleasure of his goodness as it is written in Second Thessalonians uh, uh, chapter 1, verses 11. So when you are praying that uh, they will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are just praying that as in the presence of the Father, there is no iniquity and there is no sin, so that in our life, the same may be reflected. Jesus continues to teach his disciples to pray, and he tells them in Matthew chapter 6, verse 11, give us this daily, our daily bread. And uh, when uh, we look at um, the first part of the Lord's prayer, we find that uh, the first half of the prayer of Jesus has taught us in regard to the name and the kingdom and the will. And now basically we are moving from the vertical line of prayer to the horizontal line of prayer when we are asking of this bread. But before that transition, we understand that the bread uh, spiritually is uh, the true word of God which must reign in our hearts, but also we need physical bread. And so in the first part of the prayer we are taught about the things that concerns heaven and the will of God and now we come to what pertains to man who now is uh, uh, conformed to the will of God and uh, when you have made uh, thus service of God your own interest then you can confidently pray for your own services to be supplied and so in our daily life, we really miss the blessings of the Lord's prayer because as we go through it in the pattern, we fail to realize that God must come first in everything and then man must come second so that eternal things may take precedence and the temporal things may follow. Just like in the Ten Commandments, the Lord's prayer actually we can say that it's a summary of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are actually two commandments. The first one being, love God with all your heart, your soul. And the second is like unto the same, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so the first part of the table of stones actually addresses the supreme being of the universe. The Lord's Prayer in its first segment also are addresses our infinite God. And then when you come to the second table of the commandments, it cut us for the temporal needs of humanity. When also you come to 
uh, 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 I mean, when you come to the second table of the commandments, it deals with how you deal with yourself and other human beings. And also when you come to the Lord's Prayer, it uh, uh, opens a revelation of how after being in sync with God, now you can pray for these temporal things and they be supplied. And so Mount of Blessing, page 110, this is what uh, the servant of the Lord uh, actually says mount of thoughts from the mount of blessing page 110 if you have renounced self that is the first part of the prayer and the first table of the stones of the commandments and given yourself to christ you are a member of the family of god and everything in the father's house is for you all the treasures of god are open to you both the world that now is and that which is to come and you can confidently approach the lord in prayer to supply all your needs and your wants and remember as we looked at uh, prayer the prayer of faith and uh, prayer and praise last sabbath we were saying that uh, there are two kinds of prayers that the lord will answer immediately a prayer to overcome sin and a prayer to supply the needs of others and so you as a child of god uh, as you are praying for the temporal needs of your life, we are told that in every command, in every promise, uh, uh, in every, uh, a blessing may be realized. And so as we approach our Father to give us our daily bread, he who has said that he will supply all our needs and want, we ha don't have to approach him in fear, in doubt. God will be able uh, to provide all that we need. The psalmist says that... Uh, I have been young and now I'm old, and I have never seen the children of the righteous begging for bread or going hungry. And so uh, the Lord will never actually uh, leave us to be beggars of the bread. Just as he supplies the spiritual bread, so shall he supply the needs of the soul. When you look at Psalms 37 verse 3 and Psalms uh, 37 verse 25, also in Isaiah chapter 33, he says that your water and your bread shall be sure. And so if these are the words of the Lord himself in the book of Psalms and in the book of Isaiah, we don't have to approach our God in doubt of what he shall do. When we pray, give us our daily bread, we ask for others as well as ourselves. And we acknowledge that God gives us not for ourselves alone, but whatever blessing that the Lord gives unto us, it is to meet the needs of others. And uh, you look at uh, the book of James 127, and uh, he says that uh, uh, pure and true religion, which is undefiled, is this to visit the orphans, the widows, and uh, to take care of them and to keep your flesh unspotted. And so when we are asking for temporal needs, uh, let us not use them selfishly. James chapter 4 says that we pray and we are not answers, and they strive, and we ask, and we are not given because we are praying so that we may use it for our selfish needs. But the children of God daily they will pray so that when they have been supplied with, they may be able to supply others also. The prayer for daily bread includes not only food to sustain the body. So we are told in Mount of Blessing, page 112. Uh, I'll put this on the screen so that we may be blessed together. Look at what she says in the Mount of Blessings, page 112. The prayer for daily bread includes not only food to sustain the body, but that spiritual bread which will nourish the soul unto life everlasting. Jesus bids us labor not for the meat which perishes, but that for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. And uh, I'm reminded of uh, the book of Matthew, um, where we are told um, in Matthew chapter 6, verse, uh, I think verses 27 downwards, we are told that um, the Gentiles seek after these things. And uh, our Lord knows that we need these things. And he who clothes the lilies, he who provides for the birds which does not sow or reap, doesn't he know that his children need of these things. And so he will be able to provide more exceedingly and abundantly than we ask Paul says. And so he ends in 633 by saying that 
seek the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all these things we need shall be supplied to us. When you continue with the, uh, that sermon on the mount in uh, Matthew chapter seven, he tells us that uh, we being a wicked people know how to give our children the good gifts, but how much more will the father give us his spirit? He will not just give us the daily ones when we ask of him, but he will also be able to give us the spirit to know how to use what he has provided for us. And so when we receive of Christ, we are to be suppliers of the same. We are channels of blessing to others. And then we are like watered plants besides the rivers, which it is fruits does not wither away. I think that is Psalms chapter two. And so uh, we become channels of blessing. And uh, if only our work is to receive and not supply to others, then our prayers may be hindered. And uh, when we are asking God to give us our daily bread, there's another lesson that uh, we find that this uh, teaches us. And this is in teaching us to ask every day for what we need, both temporal and spiritual blessings. God has a purpose to accomplish for our good. He will have us realize our dependence upon his constant care for he is seeking to draw us into communion with himself. In this communion with Christ through prayer and the study of the great and precious truth of his word, we shall as hungry souls be fed, as though the thirst we shall be refreshed at the fountain of life. And uh, remember the words of Jesus Christ in the book of Matthew, in the Beatitudes, he says, Blessed are the poor in the spirit. And so we become poor and thirst and hunger for this righteousness, and then the Lord will fill the void. And so when we are asking for the bread of the day, we are not just focused on that temporal bread which we eat and then it wastes away, but we are asking for enduring bread, which is spirit and life. And in, Ma in Luke chapter 11, verse 4, we find these words, forgive us our sins, or we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. What does it mean with this phrase? Jesus teaches us that we can receive forgiveness from God only as we forgive others. It is the love of God that draws us unto him and that love cannot touch our hearts without creating love for our brethren. And uh, in Mark chapter 11, we are told that uh, if we do not forgive others, we also shall not be forgiven and our prayers shall not be answered. In the Mount of Blessing, page 113, Mount of Blessing, page 113, this is what we find. We are told, after completing the Lord's Prayer, Jesus added, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you give Forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. He who is unforgiving cuts off the very channel through which alone he can receive mercy from God. There are people who say that I'll never forgive. There are people who say that they have been wronged in a way that uh, they can't be reconciled to their brethren. But they are actually, when they say that, they are closing even their blessing for forgiveness. But forgiveness has a broader meaning that many suppose. When we, when we are told to forgive and assume the character of God, as we have said that God is our father and his father, is, his name is written in our forehead. And now we come to the part of forgiving those who trespass us. What does this entail in forgiving others trespasses as even our father forgives us? When God gives the promise that he'll abundantly pardon, he adds as if the meaning of that promise exceeded all that we could comprehend. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So the forgiveness that we are told to embrace is a forgiveness that has a broader meaning 
than many of us purpose. God's forgiveness is not merely a judicial act, Mount of Blessing, page 114, by which he sets us free for condemnation. It is not only forgiveness for sin, but reclaiming from sin. When you forgive uh, your brother or your sister of what they have done, it is not just the mere judicial forgiving of the act itself, but it is reclaiming that person and embracing them and bringing them back to the fold uh, so that they may feel one uh, of the family, one of the Christian fellowship. It is the outflow of redeeming love that transforms the heart. And uh, we are told in the book of uh, John, I think, that uh, love covers a multitude of sin. David had the true conception of forgiveness when he prayed, creating me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me, Psalms 51.10. And again, he says, as far as the east from the west, so far he hath removed our transgression from us. The one thing essential for us in order that we may receive and impart the forgiving love of God is to know and believe the love that he has to us, 1 John 4.16. When we recognize the love that Father has bestowed upon us through his son, then we will be able to act in the same capacity upon those who are actually erring and those who have wronged us or those whom we have wronged. So uh, when we feel that we have sinned and cannot pray, it is then the time to pray. Ashamed we may be and deeply humble, but we must pray and believe. This is a faithful thing and worthy of all exception that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief, First Timothy, or 1 Timothy 1, 15. So let us not feel that we cannot approach our Lord in prayer. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness as is written in 1 John 1, 9. And so... Let us not think that there is something so grievous that we have done in our lives that he cannot forgive. And so when we pray, forgive us our debts, let us uh, believe that what he has promised in his word in 1 John, he will be able to do it. He will be able to uh, accomplish it. And so uh, uh, we rejoice that uh, the Lord of heaven can be able to do for us exceedingly abundantly than we may ask of him. And then uh, the, this, this, this notion in 613, bring us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. What does it entail that bring us not into temptation? Sometimes ago, this question was asked, when we pray that bring us not into temptation, what does it mean by this? Uh, phrase. Temptation is enticement to sin, and this does not proceed from God, but from Satan and from the evil of our own hearts. God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempted no man, James 1 13. Every temptation resisted, every trial bravely born gives us a new experience that advances us in the work of character building. The soul that through divine power resists temptation reveals the world and to the heavenly universe the efficiency of the grace of christ but while we are not to be dismayed by trial bitter though it be we should pray that god will not permit us to be brought where we shall be drawn away by the desires of our own evil hearts in offering the prayer that god has given we surrender ourselves to the guidance of god asking him to lead us in safe paths so praying that lead us not into temptation is actually asking God to lead us in the paths where we shall not fall in the desires of our own evil hearts and be ensnared by the enticement of the evil one. This is the way walking in it, Isaiah 30, 21. We ask of the Lord to impart on us his Holy Spirit so that uh, we may not walk in the counsels of the ungodly, but we may walk in the counsels of the righteous. The prayer bring us not into temptation is itself a promise. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 118. If we commit ourselves to God, we have the assurance he will not suffer you to be tempted above 
that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And so lead us not into temptation. It is a self, a promise. And God has said, surely, when the ways of the Lord pleases a man, he will even order his steps. So lead us not into temptation. It is just claiming the promise. Thou, Lord, as thou have said that uh, when you delight in the steps of a man, you will order his steps and you will make the evil one dwell uh, with him in peace. This is what I'm claiming when saying that, Lord, lead me not into temptation. I'm just clinging on your promise that you will order my steps. But for God to order our steps, we must incline our ear to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Live in contact with the living Christ and he will hold you firmly. Mount of Blessing, page 119. By hand that will never let go. Know and believe the Lord, the love that God has to us and you are secure. That love is a fortress impregnable to all the delusions and assaults of Satan. The name of the Lord is a strong tower the righteous run it into it and is safe, Proverbs 18.10. And you can find also that in the, uh, in, in, in the book of Psalms 125, verses 1 and 2, that um, it says that uh, uh, the name of the Lord, uh, uh, when we call upon it, we, 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 the righteous, when they uh, run unto it, uh, they like Mount Zion that cannot be moved. The one who trust in the name of the Lord, they are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved. And so uh, we continue praising the Lord for his promises, even in the Lord's prayer, thine kingdom, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Um, Satan has sought to uh, establish his kingdom after his banishment in heaven, Satan was thrown here on earth and he has sought to establish his kingdom in the hearts of men. But Christianity realizes that all kingdoms are for God and there is coming a time when he will do away with sin and iniquity and all the kingdoms under the earth shall be the kingdom of our Christ. And so in praying or in saying that um, thine is the kingdom, thy power and thy glory, we recognize that uh, Christ will be able to reign over all this kingdom and Satan has, shall have no place. The last, like the first sentence of the Lord's prayer points to our father as above, all power and authority and every name that is named. The power and the glory belong unto him whose great purpose will still move on and thwart it toward their consummation. In the prayer that breathes their daily ones, the disciples of Christ were directed to look above all the power and dominion of evil unto the Lord their God, whose kingdom ruleth over all and who is their father and everlasting friend. We don't have to be brought down in sorrow with the uh, whatever Satan is doing because he has assumed as the prince of this world, but soon and very soon, he shall realize that he has nothing. And as he forfeited his place in heaven, also he will forfeit his place on this earth. And then the meek shall be able to inherit the earth. Lastly, we are standing, now standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. A crisis is before us such as the world has never witnessed. And sweetly to us comes the assurance that God's kingdom ruleth over all. The program of coming events is in the hands of our maker. The majesty of heaven has the destiny of nations as well as the concerns of his church in his own church. The divine instructor is saying to every agent in the accomplishment of his plans, as he said to Cyrus, I guarded thee, thou thou has not known me he has promised us remember the promise and i'll be coming to it in a short while thine O lord is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine in thine hand is power and might and in thine hand is t 
expertise to make great and to give strength unto all 1 Chronicles 29, 11 and 12. Brothers and sisters, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we acknowledge the redemption plan. We acknowledge that um, as it were in the beginning, so shall it be in the end, that everything shall be restored to humanity. God will be able to do his own purpose. And it's as it was from the creation that uh, it was the purpose of God for humanity and every living being to be a temple of the heavenly father so that plan has not been thwarted although there had been an uh, interlude with the uh, origin of sin and the uh, people being plunged in iniquity and the lord will bring this to an end and uh, i like to leave you with this promise in the book of john chapter 14 verses 1 to verses 4 which we are told that uh, you believe in god also believe in me in my father's house, there are many months I go to prepare for you. If it were not so, I could have told you. I go prepare so that ah, you may be where I am also. This promise shall be fulfilled and soon it will be fulfilled. And so as we look at the Lord's Prayer, we see the redemption plan. We see how we have to obey the law of God in the first table and in the second table. And then we see the restoration of everything. What Satan has taken away from us will be restored to us. Otherwise, the Lord bless you. That is the brief that I had for you this afternoon. I know there are many things to learn. There are many things to learn in the Lord's prayer, but uh, may the Lord continue grounding you into truth and establishing you into present truth so that you may remain blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Otherwise, uh, I thank the Lord and I know that um, he will establish you and he will keep you for his own glory. And when his kingdom shall be established, then you will be subjects of that kingdom. Let us bow for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for whatever we learn. It is for our admonition. It is for our strength. And so I pray that uh, you continually be with us and teach us that we, we can understand now, Lord. May you, in your own time, help us to understand it. Be with the children and thank you for everything. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you. And uh, may the Lord bless you.